Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the future of home respiratory care, understanding the past to navigate what comes next. I'm Dave Purdy, Vice President of Sales Learning and Customer Solutions here at Drive to Bilbis Healthcare, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, along with me today is uh, Derek Lampert and Joe Lewarski, who I will introduce shortly, but I wanted to cover a few brief housekeeping issues to start. So we do want to make sure that you can all hear us. So what I'd like to do is a quick sound check. So on your GoToWebinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a hand icon that allows you to virtually raise your hand. So if you, if you can hear me clearly, please go ahead and click that hand icon and we'll just see, good, yep, um, yeah, great. Uh, looks like uh, the audio is working. I see quite a few of you raising your hands. Uh, which is great. Uh, now, if something were to happen during the presentation to affect your audio, uh, you can go ahead and notify us through the questions tab, which is also on your go to webinar panel there on the on the right hand side. And we'll certainly be monitoring that throughout the webinar. I also want to point out that if you have questions about the content, please go ahead and put them in that uh, question tab. Uh, we will pull up at the end. Uh, after Joe finishes the um, presentation to address those questions for you and uh, go from there. And, and lastly, just want to point out in the control panel, there is a handouts tab and you'll see two handouts that you could download. One is a respiratory brochure and the other is a copy of the uh, webinar presentation that Joe will be covering today. Okay, so with that, I'd like to get us started with the webinar. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you our CEO at Drive to Vilbus Healthcare, Derek Lampert. So Derek? Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to take a quick minute and say how thankful, appreciative, and excited we are that um, you, you all would uh, join us for this webinar today. Eight years ago, when Drive had the opportunity to bring the Vilbus into our family, we had no idea how special it would become. What's been accomplished out of a single plant in Somerset, Pennsylvania is nothing short of incredible. Supplying oxygen to over 100 countries, supporting countless lives in need during a pandemic that ravaged the world, allowing millions to age gracefully at home, and all while continuing to lead and innovate, the Vilbus is without question drive the Vilbus's secret weapon. 135 years is truly something special, something unheard of these days with less than 1% of US businesses lasting this long, and most importantly, something to be extremely proud of. Thanks to everyone who is joining us today. We're extremely excited to have our very own Joe Lewarski, Senior Vice President of Clinical Affairs, here to talk about the future of home respiratory care in celebration of this incredible milestone for DeVilbus. As most of you know, Joe is not only a registered respiratory therapist and fellow of the American Association for Respiratory Care, he's been an industry thought leader and advocate for nearly 40 years. With over 40 scientific papers, textbook chapters, numerous clinical and industry-related articles and white papers to his name, Joe's expertise and passion for our industry goes without saying. I believe I can speak for, for all of us in attendance today that we are very much looking forward to Joe's insights. So Joe, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Derek, and um, thanks for that generous introduction. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the screen here so you'll only hear me and not have to look at me. And, uh, <clears throat> I, I do want to thank everyone uh, for attending today. It's very humbling uh, to see the numbers of attendees, uh, particularly for a non-CEU lecture. And uh, I want to say I, I've been part of the, the drive to build this marriage and uh, now for eight and a half years, I, I came on board just at the beginning and it's, it's been one of the proudest opportunities of my, of my career. And, and this is the end of my career and uh, as the twilight of my, uh, my 40 years in, in the field. And it's just a real honor to, to participate in, uh, in this organization and also to present to you today. So I'm gonna go ahead and move ahead. Um, so I guess what 40 years of doing this gets you is uh, you're, you're a historian. So I'm in a position to uh, share the history. Um, when I became a respiratory therapist in the, in the 1980s, there were a, a couple of major brands that, that uh, every respiratory therapist going through school was familiar with. And, and DeVildis was at the top of that list. Um, you know, I used to joke, they put a tattoo on your shoulder of, uh, of DeVilbus and Puritan Bennett. Puritan Bennett's no longer around. And DeVilbus is, is the survivor of 135 years of, of innovation in medical 
devices. So it's really cool opportunity uh, to have gotten a chance to work and be a part of this organization and share in this uh, in this 135th year uh, celebration. So we, getting into respiratory therapy uh, and home care and how how the two con, you know converged, it's a pretty humble beginnings. Here's some some old photos uh, that uh, recognize the industry. It's been around a lot longer than most people think. I mean, a lot of the uh, the basic oxygen in the home and some other equipment started in the actually in the 50s and 60s, but it really didn't get organized uh, because respiratory therapy as a profession didn't even get organized really until the to the late 60s and early 1970s. So I'm going to start with a kind of a, uh, a rhetorical question, you know, um, is the development of the home respiratory therapy business and program the result of a collaboration of some of the best thought leaders and economic leaders uh, working on a model to, of transitional care from hospital to home uh, with these goals to improve patient care and clinical outcomes. So hopefully as we go through this, we'll answer this question for you, but I'm sure most of you already know the answer. So everything that happens in home care today is really a result of legislative activities that kind of created the, the, the vehicle that allowed for payment for much of the healthcare overall, but, but in particular, our, our field of home, home medical equipment, home respiratory care. And the, probably the most significant piece of legislation was the Social Security Act of 1965. This was part of uh, President Johnson's Great Society. And uh, this created, these, this law created the Medicare and the Medicaid program. So, um, which is interesting because it's, it's a relatively young concept. I mean, 1965, when you're, since I was born before then, feels, doesn't feel very old. So, uh, although it's been around for quite a while now, um, this was originally created uh, entitled the Health Insurance for the Aged and Disabled. Uh, now, all we talk about is, is Medicare. And then the Medicaid program was a, was a secondary element of that, which was, an, which was basically a, a collaboration between federal and state funding through federal grants to support medical assistance for individuals and families with low incomes and low resources. Uh, Medicaid became law in 1965. And it's interesting because when you go back and you look at these data, and I did a lot of this when I was in graduate school because this was kind of my focus, um, the estimates for the spends in the future were so far off track. And here's an example. In 1967, Congress predicted that the Medicare program would cost $12 billion by 1990. And, and, and in 1990, the pro cost of the program was $110 billion. So they, they were off by a factor of more than a factor of 10, uh, which is pretty consistent if you follow the, what a bill is supposed to be scored at in cost and what it all actually ends up costing down the line. Um, for most of you who've been doing home care, we know that Medicare and Medicaid are two of the largest purchaser or consumers of health care in the United States. Medicare expenditures, uh, the last published uh, correct, uh, at least the data that we could get our hands on is 2021, and it was $1.64 trillion or 38% 30 of all national health expenditures. Um, for our part of the world, our largest spending in home respiratory therapy, uh, oxygen still sits at the top of the list, followed very closely now by mechanical ventilation, which has been weighted more in non-invasive than invasive ventilation, and of course, aerosolized drugs and, and the equipment that goes with it. Uh, 2023 Medicare enrollment is, is right around 66 million people. Uh, and for the first time in history, the Medicare Advantage portion of the Medicare population has surpassed the traditional Medicare. And on the, on the right of the slide there, you can see, uh, I've been tracking these data since 2004. I've been tracking a lot of data since 2004 for a paper I've been working on for my lifetime that hasn't been published yet. But um, you can see that the growth is pretty consistent year over year, and it, and it tends to follow changes in culture and philosophy. So when I first started working in home care in 1990, you know, there, were, there were very little Medicare Advantage. It, it, was, it was pretty much rejected by that population, which was much made up of the greatest generation. So people pre, you know, the World War II uh, generation and managed care wasn't very popular among that, that subset of individuals. But as baby boomers are aging and baby boomers came out of uh, having, health having managed care and health insurance as the standard for them, these programs um, were, pretty, were pretty recognizable to them and they were familiar with 
PPO networks and limited networks. So it, it seems to make sense that the enrollment is growing consistently. That may be good or bad. There's a lot of press around Medicare Advantage uh, tweaking the rules uh, of the policies that Medicare, traditional Medicare has set in place for coverage and, and payment policy. So uh, that, that story is yet to be played out as we continue to see the, the shift. But that shift also makes it hard to get good data because Medicare is really one of the only organizations that publishes uh, utilization data uh, about, for example, oxygen utilization and, and other home medical equipment. And once it gets into the private sector or into the Medicaid's, we kind of lose visibility to it. It's a little harder. So it's a much more difficult task in gathering accurate data about utilization by HCPCS code or by, IC, by CPT code and things like that. Um, in 2023, uh, Medicaid and CHIP enrollment uh, is over 91 million. So if you, if you combine those, we've got almost over 157 million people in the United States covered by one of the federal or state combination programs. So that's almost half of the people in the United States. So when we talk about government-sponsored healthcare in the future, we're halfway there, if you really think about it. And if you were to throw in the number of federal employees and military and other individuals that have government tax dollars funding their health care, we're well over, well over that number. So the term that most of us don't like to use much anymore, durable medical equipment or DME company, um, that definition came from the statute and the law and, and, and all of the regulations, and that's how we're defined. So the definition in, in the policies and in the legislation is equipment that can withstand repeated use, primarily and customarily used to serve a medical purpose, and isn't generally useful to someone if they not, don't have an illness or an injury. And of course, it has to be appropriate for use in the home. And the uh, unfortunate part, you, you have to remember this stuff was developed in the early 1960s, passed into law in 1965, there wasn't a whole lot of thought about clinical services and, and the, what would be needed to support the technology. And if you think about where technology was in 1965, 1967, the state of the art wasn't what the state of the art is today, microprocessing driven ventilators and you know, portable oxygen concentrators and home infusion pumps and all of that was, was, wasn't in the minds of the authors of, of this legislation. So, when, if you look at our industry historically from the 60s through the early to mid 80s, maybe even up to the later 80s, the, it was relatively small um, and we were very fragmented, you know, kind of considered a cottage industry. And uh, most of the things were based around the rental of these durable items. So your beds, your wheelchairs, um, some bath safety, and then of course, respiratory um, was a big part of that as uh, it, as it came into the 80s and early 90s, this oxygen became more, home oxygen became more of a standard practice. One of the challenges that we faced in looking backwards is the, the statute basically dictated the payment rules and a little bit about the policy. But as far as, you know, oversight, there wasn't a lot of standardization. There weren't uh, the, accrediting, the accreditation agencies such as the Joint Commission, ACHC and the others, um, they didn't exist yet. And so when you saw one durable medical equipment company, you saw one because they might be doing things very different from the company down the street. And really what drove a lot of the behavior in a given market was when there was competition and those companies were competing for the opportunity to do business with the hospitals or the doctors or the clinics that were referring those patients. So uh, a lot of the companies actually came out of, you know, were an extrapolation of another business that had the infrastructure to do uh, deliveries of bulky, heavy metal things in the home. So there were, you know, A to Z rentals actually rented. You could rent a backhoe and a hospital bed uh, at one point in time. Uh, ambulance companies were in the business at times. Um, a lot of the oxygen was initiated out of industrial gas companies. So the same guys making welding gases and other gases were also producing the oxygen and then delivering. And then, and to this day, in many parts of the world, the industrial gas companies, the Lindy's, uh, the Praxair's, Air Liquides, they, um, they are the oxygen suppliers, the home oxygen suppliers in many other parts of the world. Pharmacies um, was also a very common place. Um, a lot of times people would come into a retail drugstore, a corner drugstore, a family-owned business, and need a walker or a wheelchair, and 
they would have a prescription and they would get it dispensed in those environments. And, and from my background where I started in home care, um, my partner's dad uh, started our business in 1956 as a drugstore. And that's exactly how we became uh, a durable medical equipment company. So things started to change um, in, in the 1980s and what, you know, the, the movement from providing care almost exclusively in the hospital to providing care outside of the hospital started as a result of some additional legislative changes. And the first was, uh, or regulatory changes. In this case, it's 1983, the, the introduction of diagnosed related groups, also commonly known as DRGs. Uh, if you're not familiar with DRGs, DRGs are the prospective pay methodology that was created uh, for health for hospital systems that combined uh, ICD-9 or now ICD-10 codes uh, and CPT codes to predetermine what the facility would get paid by Medicare for a given um, hospitalization. So let's say, for example, COPD with pneumonia uh, would be a, a, a coded number, an ICD number of 109.2, and that would be tied to a DRG, which would say 5.5 days. And so the expectation would be you would treat this patient and have them ready for discharge appropriately in five and a half days. Um, when I started working in healthcare, a COPD admission average was 14 to 21 days. So the DRGs moved in uh, and we kept them. We weaned, we did weaning trials on the floors and tried to get people off oxygen before we ever, before we ever discharged them. After the, the DRGs and the term length of stay became a relevant concept because um, if you exceeded it, you didn't get paid. And this is still true today. So it, with, with the DRG, now they're looking at, the hospital started to have more of like a, a hotel philosophy, right? I, I need to have, I can't have empty rooms and I need to turn these beds once I stop getting paid. So discharge planning and, and, and the concept of transitions of care started to become a more relevant concept at that point in time. We also developed some terms that came out of it, like we were discharging people quicker and sicker and a treat them and street them. And those were common phrases that be, were popular when I first got into home care. Hospice also became an important part of the benefit, which was, which was passed in 1982 and to promote palliative care in the home and continues to be a very large part of home care in the United States. Uh, and hospice, if, if you've been in the hospice business, and I know many, many of the home uh, equipment providers are, you know that they're pretty large consumers of, of equipment as they work to keep patients comfortable uh, in, in these last days of their lives. So, so as part of that, health insurance started to add on riders. Um, it was pretty common when I first got into home care in 1990 uh, for, for individuals not to have durable medical equipment coverage as part of their health care plan. Uh, in fact, Kaiser, which in, in my geographic area, Kaiser, about 50 to 70% of the Kaiser patients in the early 90s didn't have a DME rider. So they had to pay cash if they needed durable medical equipment. That obviously has changed significantly since then. And DME is pretty much part of every insurance policy, whether the deductibles and copays may change, but, but the, uh, the coverage is, is clearly recognized almost across the board. So, um, and so what was happening in the background between the 80s and the 90s, um, pharmaceutical advances, technological advances, all the things that weren't contemplated in 1965 be, are becoming relevant. And, I, and, and so things like oxygen concentrators became much more of a standard of oxygen delivery by the early 1990s. And hospitals were, were, were starting to allow more complex patients to be discharged, um, including, including infants and, and, and small children. Um, and, and as a case in point, I, I happen to work in the Cleveland area, and, and, and in the early 1990s, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, which was part of the university health system, uh, had a policy they would not discharge infants home on oxygen or with trachs. And so there were children that, that were staying in the acute care facility for nine or 10 months at times. And as Medicaid, the state Medicaid started changing payment for that group, we started doing a lot more home care, and it became a massive part of my business was disproportionately complex pediatrics for many years as we so something that was almost considered malpractice in 1990 by 1995 was standard of practice and we were taking infants and small children home on oxygen kids with trachs really technically complex children and i'm sure many of you have that same story 
So from the 90s forward, we kind of started evolving into what we are today, where we're managing chronic care and technology and the uh, dependency in the home. Hot home oxygen for many of us in respiratory uh, was, the, was the catalyst that got respiratory therapy active in, in the home care world. So this is really where many of us found employment uh, as we left the hospitals at different points. Mine was 1990. And uh, the, study, the first seminal study that really demonstrated there was a, a long-term clinical benefit of treating chronic hypoxemia with oxygen came out of the 1974 Sugarloaf Conference, which was a, kind of the first conference to really look at evidence-based approaches to pulmonary medicine. And uh, out of that conference came a couple of things. One, the identification that intermittent pulmonary uh, positive pressure breathing treatments, IPPB, which was a major part of respiratory therapy in the 70s, 80s, and, and, and up until the early 90s, uh, was, was kind of a worthless therapy and we needed to stop doing it. Also, there was the, the contemplation that we need to treat chronic hypoxemia in patients with chronic lung disease because it could improve survival. And, and the most famous study coming out of that work was the nocturnal oxygen therapy trial, the, uh, commonly known as the NOT study, which was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1980. And in that photograph on the right of the slide is Dr. Thomas Petty uh, standing next to one of the early oxygen concentrators. Now, Petty's a pretty tall guy. I, I, got the, I had the incredible opportunity to work with Tom on a, a number of projects over the years in the fifth and sixth uh, consensus conferences on long-term oxygen. And it, he's about six, I think he was about six four. So you can get a, get a feel for how big that wooden oxygen concentrator uh, was that was seated next, that, that's next to him as he's talking to that particular patient. Um, there was a concurrent study that was run in the, in the UK called the, it was called the British Medical Research uh, Council Working Party on Long-Term Domiciliary Oxygen for the Treatment of Chronic Hypoxic Core Pulmonale, more or less pa patients with chronic lung disease and also some cardiac involvement. It was a smaller study, but it ended up being a longer study. But these two studies both concluded that if you treat patients who have chronic hypoxemia as a result of chronic obstructive lung disease, with oxygen therapy that you can improve survival. And the summary of those two studies, which are still the most referenced studies uh, supporting the use of oxygen therapy in the home today um, is right there. It's uh, the, the, the medical necessity criteria that we're also familiar with, a PAO, the qualifying criteria for going home on oxygen, uh, a PAO2 of less than 55 millimeters of mercury or saturation less than 88%, when you're in a quote chronic stable condition, those came directly from the NOT study. That was the entry criteria to qualify for oxygen going home, was being healthy in your best stable condition and seated in a chair, 20 minutes rested, and your blood gas had a PAO2 of less than 55 or your saturation, which there were no pulse oximeters. So this was saturation me measured um, through laboratory. Um, uh, procedure as opposed to uh, pulse oximetry. It was co-oximetry. So um, that's the background on oxygen. And uh, the first national coverage determination, the NCD was introduced in 1987. And then subsequently, the fee schedule and monthly rental amounts were, were standardized in 1989, which came out of the... I'm not going to go through all these in detail because there's a lot here and we have a lot to cover. But um, no money, no mission is, the, is always the philosophy in healthcare and just about everything else in business. So when, when, as the money changed, the mission changed. And, and many of these uh, acts, or, or legislative and or regulatory changes, impacted the money. And that's typically how they, they, they try to control utilization. So over 87 was the Federal Nursing Home Reform Act, but included in that act was uh, the new DME fee schedule, because before you got a percentage of what you build, now the fee schedule told you what you're going to get paid. And they also introduced what was called the modality neutral oxygen payment. Prior to the, the over 87, oxygen was paid for by consumption. So if you were using liquid or you, or you were using uh, gaseous oxygen, large cylinders, you were paid for consumption. And liquid was incredibly lucrative because 50% of the usage is, is, is evaporation and 50% was going to the patient. So you were getting paid for both. So, you know, you were often filling 
you know, a higher flow patient, let's say a three or a four liter per minute patient, uh, you might be doing two fills a week and you were getting paid for all the excess. So it was very, very lucrative. And, and of course, pre, pre-1989, pre-1990, a disproportionate number of people were on liquid. And once this became modality neutral, CMS was recognizing oxygen concentrators as an equivalent oxygen uh, delivery device to liquid. So they, they basically said, we don't care how you deliver oxygen, liquid, gaseous, or concentrator, you're getting the same payment regardless of the technology. And that, that really introduced the, the movement of oxygen concentrators and, and a lot of the technological advancements um, that have come since then were triggered by that modality neutral when oxygen concentrators became the uh, predominant oxygen delivery device. Today, at least in the Medicare data set, about 98% of all stationary oxygen is provided via concentrator. And then fast forward a decade, uh, Balanced Budget Act of 97, um, they went after oxygen very aggressively and cut the oxygen payment just right off the top, 30%. There are other things were introduced in there, other changes to the, to, to the healthcare system. They introduced a, a, a prospective payment in long-term care. That actually killed respiratory therapy and long-term care. Uh, because the, the rugs introduced a, uh, a new payment methodology that was similar at the time to a kind of a DRG, but different method behind it, but it, but it was a prospective pay and it, and it really chopped up the way nurses homes got paid for services. And um, a lot of nursing homes uh, filed bankruptcy during that window. Um, and then similarly, there were, there were lots of changes to the Home Health Nursing Act uh, and also went to a prospective payment model as opposed to a, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a billing plus or a cost plus model. Uh, and that, that's continued to evolve uh, into a, a couple of different names. The original was using the OASIS uh, methodology. And then 1999, the RAD policy. Um, so after a large uh, or a rapid growth in the use of bi-level devices, particularly bi-level uh, ST devices, um, in the in COPD went from essentially no utilization to multi-million dollar utilization. There were a lot of um, activities around overutilization, and ultimately, uh, between the reg between the regulators and the clinical community, concluded at that time that there was no clinical evidence to support that BiPAP made much of a difference in outcomes in COPD by level devices, non-invasively, and they introduced the RAD policy, which um, came into effect in 2006, and for most, for, for a long time, basically eliminated the, uh, the, cri the criteria was so strict, it eliminated um, the opportunity for most COPD patients to be trialed on, on non-invasive ventilation, particularly using a device like a bi-level device with a backup rate. Um, more oxygen cuts in 2005, uh, and I'm just gonna kind of buzz through the rest of these. You can see that the no money, no mission is driven by by cuts, basically. Uh, over the years, home care has taken a disproportionate number of hits, uh, while the other sectors of our, of our healthcare dollar have been continuing to increase, even in the face of some cuts. Um, you'll see on most of these, there's, there's DME cuts in nearly every act that, that was passed or every piece of legislation that was passed. So everybody's familiar with the 2010 Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, also re commonly referred to as Obamacare. Lots of interesting things came out of there, but you know the jury is still out on a lot of that, and um, I'm not going to dive into that. We could spend a whole lecture on just you know what what happened from the Affordable Care Act and what what are the outcomes of that. The, another another milestone is competitive bidding. Um, it was bad from design from the start, and it's been bad ever since. Uh, and you can see that <clears throat> there was a significant reduction after the round one trial and. That just continued into round two, the round one recompete, and then the, the national expansion by 2014. And you can just see the billions of dollars that have been impacted um, as a result of these methods of, you know, what I would consider a, um, a, a multiplayer, uh, you know, prisoner's dilemma game theory uh, approach where, you know, bidding to the bottom got you a got you a golden ticket to participate, even though you didn't necessarily have to, um, I'm sorry, you didn't have to uh, accept the bid that you had submitted. But it, obviously, like, there's a lot of detail behind that as well, and most of you know it uh, extremely well. 
And kind of the last thing that's been looking at and taking a hit was home mechanical ventilation. So because the RAD policy basically put a stranglehold on the opportunity to use non-invasive ventilation effectively in COPD patients, which is now a standard of practice in the acute care environment, um, the movement shifted to using traditional mechanical ventilators for non-invasive applications um, following the, the same pattern as what was happening in the acute care setting. And I've, and much like any time there's a new opportunity or a new, a new approach to care introduced, utilization went up significantly. Um, so in 2015, the, the CMS restructured the HCPCS codes and the payment models, and there was a significant reduction in payment for these complex ventilators. And so when you sum it all up, there's um, the durable medical equipment benefit has taken a lot of hits. Over, over the last two decades or three decades even. And you can see in these that we've never represented a very big piece of the overall spending pie, yet we're, we're frequently taking, take the greatest hits as a proportion of our expenditure. So you can see year over year, our spending actually goes down, even though utilization may be going up. So that means you're doing a lot more work for a lot less money. And over here, this uh, was actually, um, I think a, uh, I sold this from an AA home care uh, document, which was derived from uh, CMS information. Uh, you can see throughout all of those era, that era of cuts and legislative changes and regulatory changes, that, that orange line there at the bottom represents DME. And you can see while almost everyone else was, was trending at least upward a little bit, home health the least, um, everybody else saw continued increase in expenditures and we stayed flat or slightly down in comparison to every other area of healthcare. So why are we spending so much time talking about it? Because there's a lot of unintended consequences and respiratory therapy has been hidden behind all of this and, and the changes that have impact respiratory therapy uh, are, are a direct result of the changes associated with the payment methodology. So NCB, as I said, it was a multiplayer game that was, poor, was poorly designed from our perspective, but brilliantly designed from CMS's perspective to get the outcome that they, that they sought, which was a race to the bottom and elimination of home medical equipment providers. And both happened. Reimbursement went down dramatically, um, as low as $77 a month in, in, the, in the lowest um, bid market. And the number of suppliers has declined exponentially over the last eight to 10 years, uh, with some markets seeing more than half of the, of the suppliers uh, leave the business. Now, some of that is through acquisition, so those were absorbed into larger companies, and some was companies just went in a different direction and found an, another way to make a living. Um, while it was <clears throat> never publicly announced, many HME companies significantly reduced the number of RTs they had on staff and really redistributed what they focused on in their workloads uh, away from what got us here, which was oxygen and aerosol therapy, uh, and, and to really focusing on mechanical ventilation, NIV in particular, and PAP therapies. <clears throat> and so uh, I think there was only one company, I believe, I believe it was um, one of the large nationals made an announcement shortly after uh, after the, the implementation of, of, of the competitive bidding payment structures, where they pretty much eliminated most of their RTs and only kept a small number on staff, um, and particularly in states where there was some legislation that required RTs to be involved in certain elements. Um, so <clears throat> following that, there was a lot of work done. Um, there was a lot of complaints from, from beneficiaries. There was a study that was I think funded by a home care by Dobson to, uh, and Associates that uh, surveyed and, and they came up with these data here, 52% of beneficiaries reported problems getting access to DME, 89% uh, of the case managers were, were reporting difficulty finding, uh, finding suppliers that were up the approved uh, bid winners and there were significant delays in comparison to pre-competitive bid opportunity and of course liquid oxygen with the with the, the draconian you know, reduction from the, from the baseline uh, has almost gone away. And there are many states where there, there's no one supplying liquid oxygen today. Uh, 
much later here in, in the late 2000, around 18, um, there was a, a survey done of oxygen patients uh, that was published by this oxygen working group that's a, that is a, a cross-functional group of people that, that is led by the ATS. And Susan Jacobs was the lead author of this particular paper that was published in the Annals of ATS in, eight, in January 18. They looked at they surveyed a lot of home oxygen patients and they basically concluded, you know, that this is killed liquid and that many oxygen uh, patients uh, report few, if any, interactions with a respiratory therapist. Uh, and there, there's, and I'll talk about it a little later here in the, in the talk, there's some legislative efforts going underway to try to remediate some of that. So to answer the question, no, this wasn't a well thought out strategy. There were no Harvard and Yale economics majors to try and design. We kind of fell backwards into home respiratory therapy, not all that different than we fell back into respiratory therapy. Um, when we became, we went from oxygen orderlies to inhalation technicians, to inhalation therapists, to respiratory therapists. So no, it wasn't well thought out and we've been kind of making it up as we've gone. Um, and there's been good good elements of that, some incredible work come out of that. And then there's been the downside, which, you know, as a result of lack of standards, lack of regulations that, that defined and protected us. So where are we? And what was home respiratory therapy intended to do? When I started doing this in 1990, um, the respiratory therapy departments at all the major hospitals in my market controlled the discharge of respiratory patients. There weren't case managers and care management departments yet. Uh, that, was, that was yet to come. So you, we, we would make our sales calls to the respiratory therapy departments and form relationships with those respiratory therapy departments. Many times we hired people from those res respiratory therapy departments to follow patients. And um, they, would, they would send those referrals to the companies they believed matched the level of care that, that, was, that they expected based on what they did in the hospital. So we used to, uh, when I started in home care in 1990, respiratory therapists visited every oxygen patient once a month. And we did a clinical assessment. We listened to their lungs. We, um, we checked their, their SAT if, you know, uh, with, with, an analy uh, with a pulse oximeter. We checked the performance of their concentrator and, and we would send these reports to their physicians. Um, and that was basically because we were mirroring what respiratory therapists were still doing in the 90s in the hospitals, which included oxygen rounds. Similar uh, with vent ventilator patients, when we took ventilator, I had a fairly large ventilator program. Uh, we spent two to three weeks while the patient was in the hospital doing training with the family and getting them acclimated to the ventilator they're gonna be going on at home. And then at least my protocol in our company, and, and there were others that used a similar protocol, once they got home, we saw them every day the first week, every other day the second week, twice the third week, and then we started them on a once a month uh, rotation. And so the biggest difference between what, what I did as a respiratory therapist in the hospital and what I did as a respiratory therapy in the home is there was less actual provision of therapy, hands-on touching. I wasn't giving aerosol treatments all day long or doing chest PT. I was more of a therapy consultant. We were teaching the families, caregivers, often the, the agency nurses, how to manage the equipment uh, for those patients in the home when we weren't there. Um, and for a long time, one of our greatest challenges was there wasn't a, there wasn't a set of standards to, to look to. We, we are all doing our practice based on what the local hospitals that were giving us a business uh, practices were. And a number of years ago, I wrote a paper on trach tracheostomy care, for example. And when we were looking at the literature and looking at a clinical-based, you know, an evidence-based approach, it was really, there was no evidence-based approach to trach care in the home. It was all based on local, local behaviors, local beliefs of the hospitals that were sending you those patients. So there wasn't a standard methodology or process the way we manage trachs frequently of trach changes, trach training clits, uh, trach uh, cleaning kits and things like that. Those are dictated generally locally by the payers and by the by the the demands of of the hospitals that were sending you those referrals. The first time the accreditation um, in home care showed up in 1988, no one was getting accredited in DME. Um, the first time I helped a company was around 1991, um, and then my own company in 92. Uh, when I in 92, we we got accredited in the late 1990s. 
Uh, it was voluntary, obviously, and there was really one accrediting agency back then for the most part, and that was the Joint Commission. And they introduced their standards um, first uh, for home care and also uh, for clinical respiratory services, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain quickly in a second. Um, now accreditation is a requirement to participate in the program, and there's, there's at least nine uh, deemed uh, authorities or third-party organizations that can do accreditation. So there is some standardization, but one of the holes in that is for respiratory therapy in particular. So what, what are we haunted by and, and why aren't we getting paid for respiratory therapy and why isn't it called out as a demand? Um, unfortunately, despite us having, you know, bachelors and, and, and masters, and I know quite a number of people with PhDs, um, we are not recognized under the CMS statute as healthcare professionals. Respiratory therapy is bucketed in a group of non-covered um, ancillary uh, uh, healthcare providers, such as nurses, aides, and orderlies. We're not at the peer level to the people who should be our peers nursing, pharmacy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, social work, et cetera, all who are recognized um, as uh, ancillary health professionals. So we, we are in a kind of a no man's land zone where we, they know who we are and what we are, but there's no mechanism to pay us because we don't meet the criteria as a healthcare professional. And even to, to, to put poor salt in that wound, in the oxygen policy where they know respiratory therapists were used very in intensely for many, many years, they specifically have called out in the NCDs uh, and the LCDs that respiratory therapy services are not covered under the provisions of oxygen. It's, it's, uh, this benefit is solely for home oxygen and equipment and does not include a professional component. And so there's no place for us to, to check a box and say the, the Therapist did this procedure today and, and there's a billing code to support it and you get paid X. Um, we are not recognized under Part A. In the hospitals today, respiratory therapy departments exist, but they are cost centers. There, there's no revenue generation that comes solely from the work the respiratory therapist does. Bedside treatments, oximetry, blood gases, those are all bundled into the DRG and as is the respiratory therapist. So they went from very robust revenue generating departments to cost centers. Um, and run very lean in many places. Um, over the years, there have been, the, the American Association for Respiratory Care has introduced a number of pieces of legislation to try to get respiratory therapy recognized as a profession under either Medicare Part A or Part B, and uh, those efforts were unsuccessful. And part of the reason we were unsuccessful is wasn't budget neutral, it was going to add cost to the system, which is never a good thing um, in the eyes of, of, of the payers. And the other was we had strong opposition from many of our friends and colleagues in the other allied health professions, such as physical therapy. Um, one of the biggest lobbyists opposing respiratory therapy being recognized as professional was the American Nursing Association. Um, there's territorial concerns and everybody's worried that someone's going to infringe on their on their practice act and take away revenue opportunities even when there's a shortage a worldwide shortage or a national shortage of nurses and other other uh ancillary health professionals there was continued to be strong opposition opposing us um, from the nursing community from the other therapies communities pt ot and so on Some of our other challenges has been there just hasn't been a lot of strong evidence to say that what we do makes a difference. Now, I don't agree with that opinion, but you know, while there's more studies starting to show up over the last decade, uh, there, most of the, it, it's a small number of studies and a lot have been focused on asthma or COPD and readmission prevention. And there have been a few that have been um, HME driven programs. Um, I've, I've cited a couple here. Uh, and then some that were hospital-based, where they used hospital-based therapists as COPD extenders to go into the home uh, to do follow-up and, and, and assessments and such. Um, one of the challenges in doing anything really in the home is uh, it's a very difficult place to control activity and, 
and there are a lot of variables to contend with. And since a lot of our work is around equipment, you can't really blind them. So the, the idea of a randomized controlled double blinded study, you know, which is the, the gold standard for research is nearly impossible to do in the environments of care that we work in because, you know, you can't, you, you, you can't always, you can't blind everybody. Somebody has to know what's going on and, and uh, it's very difficult to regulate utilization um, unless you're going in every day and there's just not a lot of funding for that. The second is there just hasn't been a lot of grant money and, and R&D money focused on, on home care in particular, but particularly home respiratory care, uh, which is unfortunate and we need to continue to fight for that. Um, for the manufacturers, for a long time, they used to be the primary source of getting information about home medical equipment and its applications out there. But a number of years ago, a little more than a decade ago, it started to become uh, frowned upon and many of the journals have moved away and will no longer accept any manufacturer performed or sponsored research for, for review in a peer reviewed journal. So the only way it can be done if you're reading studies and papers is when there's a more of a generic grant, an unrestricted grant, and the hospital chooses to study home oxygen equipment, a home mechanical ventilator, whatever that device might be, and publish performance characteristics and stuff. And even today, um, the, I just came from the AARC conference, was last week in, and, uh, in Nashville, and there were only two home care lectures. Um, and they were, one wasn't even a, given by someone who's ever worked in home care. Um, they don't let manufacturers or people from quote industry present at these conferences anymore uh, at the national level, not at the state level. Many of the states still do because that's where many of the subject matter experts on home medical equipment reside. Now they work for manufacturers uh, or other organizations that are considered industry by, uh, by some of these organizations. So we've, we've had a struggle of proving objectively through good science um, the evidence that supports all the activities that we do. And it's growing and it's getting better and more companies are doing it. It's just gonna take time to build that database. Um, there is, and the Joint Commission introduced this in the 1990s, it was called Clinical Respiratory Services. And they, they were the first to define what such could be in the home. And this is the definition, clinical respiratory services may uh, include patient assessment, such as HMP, things like that. Um, any education regarding disease, medication, actually doing a treatment. You know, my therapist did trach changes on vent patients in the home, for example. Um, and then also consider, you know, monitoring outcomes of care, measuring progress using blood gases, saturations, pulmonary functions, peak flows, things like that. Um, however, it's not mandatory and no, you don't get paid for it and there's no extra benefit. You, you pay them extra for surveying you for it, but there is no relationship between the provision of clinical respiratory services and direct payment for those services. It's a good starting point to have a, an accrediting body call it out and recognize it, but we're still a long way from getting paid. So our own perception. Um, in 1990, when I became a respiratory therapist, I tell this story a lot, I'll make it quick. Um, I had left the hospitals where I was a director. I was a director of respiratory therapy in a small hospital and went to work in, in home care because I saw it as fertile ground and an opportunity uh, to do some, some cool things. And once I did that, I was actually treated like a lesser clinician. Uh, we, were, we were frequently called industry. Um, the, the running joke was like, oh, you became a home care therapist. What are you, you got banned from the hospital or did you just get out of prison uh, or something along those lines? And in many cases, we couldn't participate in some of the professional organizations. Um, and I tell the story, in Northeast Ohio, where my company was at the time, we had a lot of hospitals and a lot of clinicians and respiratory therapy. And they had an association called the Northeast Ohio Respiratory Care Managers Association. And it was for managers and above to network with other managers and directors and you know um, senior management people in the respiratory therapy departments within all the hospitals in Northeast Ohio. So it was a really cool opportunity. I was director of respiratory therapy at the, co the first company I worked at. And so my boss said, hey, you should join us. You'll get to meet everybody in Cleveland because I was new to Cleveland coming back um, in 1989. And uh, I filled out my application and sent my money and I got my rejection letter in the mail thanking me um, and, if I, and letting me know that I'm, I'm not a respiratory therapist and, I, and, and I'm not a director and I'm not eligible to be a member. 
But if I wanted to be a sponsor as industry, I could send them a check for $500. So obviously I threw, threw that away. And um, in, in, in a twist of irony, as hospitals continued to downside respiratory therapy departments over the next decade, by the end of the 90s, all of the officers of the Northeast Ohio Respiratory Care Association were working in home care, and three of them worked for me. So there's karma. Uh, we did get some payback. Today, at least we're recognized as, as critical members of the profession. We did have a, a home care section for many years um, and at the AARC. Uh, I had the pleasure to serve five years as the home care section chair. Uh, I sat on the board of directors representing home care at the AARC. Um, we had people in a lot of leadership roles at various organizations from AA Home Care. Even today, Tom Ryan, uh, the, the leader of AA Home Care, is a respiratory therapist. Um, the Home Care Steering Committees for ACCP, we had respiratory therapists from Home Care, NAMDARC, uh, which is no longer around. Many of us have been able to get become fellows, um, and lots of home RTs have published and and uh, and have gotten to speak at many at many meetings, albeit not necessarily at the national meetings anymore. Um, so the modern RT is is a is an educated, you know, skilled professional, but yet we're still fighting for that recognition. It's kind of quite as bad as my first walk into it, but uh, we're, we're not where we need to be. When I started in home care, um, the the past was was my daily my daily workload. So we, as I said, we set up and followed every oxygen patient, including clinical assessments. Later, when conserving devices came out, we titrated every patient. Um, we set up every aerosol uh, and actually did the first treatment with them uh, in the home. Infant apnea monitoring, which is pretty much gone today, was, a, was an important part of, we, of getting uh, preemies that were still having apnea prematurity or evidence of, of, of apnea prematurity going home on, on apnea monitors. Many of kids I was with in the NICUs were going home on, on other therapies as well, some with trach, some with tube feed, some, some on oxygen. CPAP was still new, but we were getting involved in a lot of the CPAP setups and ventilation, which was disproportionately invasive mechanical ventilation, mostly spinal injury um, and uh, neuromuscular, was also non-invasive, but using volume ventilators, and it was often uh, post-polio or uh, obesity hypoventilation uh, where they didn't want to do an intubation. But you can see that therapists were doing a lot. And, and, and I wasn't, my company wasn't different than many others around the United States, that we were, we were touching a lot of things. Today, and I talked to a lot of my friends who are still running home respiratory companies, um, when I ask them what their therapists spend most of their day on, it's, it's heavily weighted in NIV and CPAP uh, because that's where the revenue supports their activity. Uh, some companies are still titrating their oxygen patients, but not all. Um, and then obviously there are companies that focus on technically complex and are doing invasive ventilation and children and, and adults with trachs and more technically complex patients. And then obviously the niche things that are lower in volume, but higher in, in complexity, like the airway clearance technologies, um, those are still what the therapist spends their time on. But when I ask colleagues at companies that I have a great deal of respect for what their therapists spend most time on, they frequently tell me non-invasive ventilation and CPAP, and that, that consumes about 90% of their time. So obviously a pretty strong shift in the direction. And this was uh, my quote at the top here comes from a paper that I got to be a co-author on uh, that, was, that was done uh, in, in 2019, and it was basically the focus of a keynote address at the AARC in uh, 2020 by Jer Dr. Jerry Krishnan, and he, and he basically said, what we didn't understand when, when the payment for auction was reasonable, and re by reasonable, I mean back in the, 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 the pre-competitive bidding uh, and even before that, before the Balanced Budget Act of 98, the oxygen payment was a subsidizer that provided a hidden safety net where the RTs were doing a lot of intensive interaction and care with patients and we're preventing hospitalizations and overutilization of care, but we never tracked and trended that data and proved that point before they took it away. And so that hidden safety net is gone, and now you've got groups forming to try to get it back, and my, my hope is that it's not too little too late. So where are we today? This is us. 
I think the modern home care RT uh, is a is a is a subject matter expert. You have to know business. You have to be professional. You have to be able to communicate at a lot of levels with a lot of different uh, different people. Uh, I always used to joke, you got to be able to read, write, eat, talk on the phone, and drive at the same time. Um, you're you're a patient advocate, and in many cases, um, when that RT goes in the home, they're the only one going in that individual's home. So. Sometimes you're the case manager, sometimes you're the physician extender, sometimes you're helping to figure out what's getting paid for, and you do a little bit of everything. But it's, it's an important job, and it's something that often gets overlooked. So the, the conflict that we have today is we have a growing need for home respiratory therapy, and we have a significant erosion of funding and resources to support it. So, you know, we had the COVID experiment which got a lot of attention for respiratory therapy um, and and you can see that for example there, there was a study here that i'm referencing where they were using they were catching patients in the emergency room and discharging them home on oxygen to prevent a hospital admission to keep beds open for more acutely ill patients with covid and uh, respiratory ramifications of covid uh, anybody who's ever had an elderly family member stuck in a hospital knows they want to come home um, we have the technology to do just about anything in the home that needs to be done, um, but we don't have the funding to support much of the things that can be done. So you can, having all this cool technology doesn't do much if there's nobody to manage it. And, and, and this is the challenge that we have is that the unintended consequences of these cuts, which were obviously to reduce expenditures, has, has wiped out this, this invisible safety net and now we're, you know, we're facing the, what, what's left over. And we've had significant number of, a decline in the number of HME providers. We've had um, significant numbers of people leaving the field from home care. And this was a study that was done in 2011. So it's pretty dated. It was right after round one. Um, but you can see that at that time um, from this survey that was done and published in respiratory care, 61% of the, uh, the people decreased what the therapists were doing in patient visits and a third uh, reduced the number of modalities that they covered and I've kind of covered that. The respiratory therapy home care section at AARC is gone, it doesn't exist today. It's a hodgepodge section called post-acute care with a couple hundred members. Uh, they no longer have board representation. So there's no board member sitting there fighting for respiratory home care. Um, and that, that was a major accomplishment. We had it for quite a number of years and then we lost it. So where are we going? What's the crystal ball? What you, you know? What's the focus of this lecture? Well, if I knew the answer to that, I would be sitting on a yacht and giving this lecture from there, um, and hopefully collecting a lot of money. But what we know is that we are needed more now than ever. We're doing more chronic care in the home. We're taking care of a of a of a myriad of complex disorders from cardiopulmonary, neuromuscular. You know, the list is up there on the screen. We can do pretty much anything in the home that they can do in the hospital when it comes to managing a complex patient. We have these programs that are evolving value-based and bundled payment models. And there are, I, I, see, I see glimmers of hope in programs that uh, for, uh, some friends and colleagues are doing where they are getting paid for value-based care. They're getting paid for you know, population health, but they're the exception rather than the rule. And we, we need to find a way to make that the rule and to tie that back and partner it with the home medical equipment payments so that we're doing them concurrently because that's really where they connect. Um, there's a, another effort going on right now to try to find a way to get respiratory therapy paid. Um, there's no subsidization through the equipment anymore. You can't really subsidize doing true home respiratory care based on what you're getting paid for the rental, the purchase of the equipment. Um, Keeping them in the hospital is not a, not a benefit. It's not good for the patients, and it's clearly the most expensive place you can provide care. So there are a number of activities going on. I would, I would encourage you to look into them. The ATS, College of Chess Physicians, AARC, are promoting a piece of legislation. I'm not sure this is the solution. Um, they have a four pillars effort going on where they want to, one, they want to bring liquid back and pay it, have it paid more, uh, more for it uh, for high flow patients, which they haven't really properly defined in my opinion. Um, they wanna design and standardize the, the care better and, um, and then they wanna find funding so that RTs are interacting with not just all oxygen patients, but all patients getting respiratory therapy. So I hope it's not a glim 
look at the future, but recognizing that there's opportunity, we just have to, you know, buckle up your helmet, put your mouth guard in and plow forward because it's not going to be an easy path to keep the trajectory that we started with in respiratory therapy, where it became a major part of the, a part of the health system. You know, we're kind of in caught in the in the weeds right now as we're fighting for identification and payment and justification. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and thank you all for attending uh, this afternoon. I hope there's some time for questions. And um, if you if you can, you know, we appreciate the business that supports what we do. And and please take a look at, at the technologies that we offer, um, particularly oxygen, which is Devilbus was invented its first oxygen concentrator in 1978. So Thank you all for, for, for listening and for the time you've given us today. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, so there were a few questions that came in through the panel, and I just uh, wanted to see if potentially you could address those. Uh, one, there was a, a comment and then a question around uh, your slide on the AARC conference. One was around they're no longer, you know, it's tough to get um, I guess approval to go to those because there are, has been a lack of presentations. And then a, a subsequent follow-up question was, what presentations would you like to see or would you recommend at the AARC uh, conference, Joe? Well, that, that's great. Um, as far as the funding, I think the, the best way to get more home focused, pro, home respiratory programs focused is to contact the AARC, one, be a member, and two, complain. Um, I have a call on Friday with the chief operating officer of the AARC uh, specifically for that purpose is to let him know how disappointing I, it was to really have no lectures uh, in, in my area and that the quality of at least one of the two lectures wasn't wasn't up to par and uh, that we're discounting or, uh, uh, you know, a significant part of our profession. So um, and I recognize if there's no lectures, it's hard to get funding from your boss to, to go to a conference to go learn something novel when there's nothing on the on the agenda. Um, what was the second part of the question, Dave? Uh, th that was pretty much it. Uh, y you hit it. I, I think they, they were saying, you know, what what uh, home care presentations would you like to see? So if there are any specifics there, Chris well, was uh, looking yeah. to you know make a, a, a submit a proposal on that. So. Sure. If, you, if you're doing something novel out there and you've got you're getting paid for certain services or you you've got an agreement uh, where you're you know, you're taking risk on something and you're using respiratory therapists to offset that risk. Talk about it. Write it up. Put it into a. am happy to help you. I've, I've given a lot of lectures over the years and I know what the, I, I was on the AARC's program committee for a few years. So I would help, I'd be happy to help anyone um, put together a proposal for a talk. And if you don't want to give the talk yourself help you write it up in a way that they can find a speaker that would be appropriate for it. And um, we'll make sure you have my contact information uh, uh, at the end of this. Um, uh, and you, you can find me here, Jay Lewarski at drivemedical.com. Very good. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll leave it there. there there's a, a few more that we can address uh, individually on email. Okay. Um, but uh, with that, I'd like to wrap up the web webinar and want to, um, again, uh, join Joe in thanking all of you for taking your time out of your day to join us uh, for this webinar today. We hope that you found it insightful and informative. And as we end this webinar, there'll be a short survey. We encourage you to give us your feedback. We very much look forward to reading it. And have a great day, everyone.